<clears throat> All right, God's will for a woman. God's will for a woman. So I'm just preaching because today's Mother's Day. Uh, I just thought I'd preach on uh, some things in the Bible that God wants for a woman. That's what God's will means. It just means what, would, what does God want for a woman. And it's quite clear in the Bible, some things that God wants for a woman. We saw that in 1 Timothy 5. We'll go there in a moment. But in Ephesians 6, we looked at it in Kids Club this morning, Ephesians 6, Honour thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. So isn't it interesting? And I mean, we don't really know how this works scientifically, but God promises in his word that if we honour our father and mother, that is one of the commandments that had a promise attached to it. And the promise was that your life would go well, may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. So I don't know the scientific reasoning behind this, whether it's just, you know, your life may be less stressful, creating less, uh, you know, uh, was it free radicals in your body and destroying your body. But, uh, you know, God promises, you know, we honor our mother and father and we'll be well with us and we'll live long on the earth. So if you want to live longer, honor your father and mother. Now, honor doesn't mean necessarily obey. You know, in Ephesians 6.1, uh, I don't have the verse there, it says, children, obey your parents. You know, you can honor your father and mother. You can disagree with your mother and father, but still honor them. You may not do what they ask you. You know, sometimes parents, when, when you get older, they still treat you like a child, right? They still expect you to do everything that they tell you to do. But as adults, it is okay, like Jesus did. When, you know, when Mary asked Jesus for wine, he says, what a woman, what have I to do with thee? You know, but that shows that even though Mary was his mother, his earthly mother, you know, he had them some things to do. He didn't just do everything that she asked. Um, so honoring your father and mother is not the same as obeying your father and mother. You know, but children who live in their father and mother's house, you know, they should obey their father and mother. But on Mother's Day, you know, we ought to honor and love our mothers. But I think something that's good for Christians to be reminded of on Mother's Day is that we ought not to honor and love our mothers more than we honor the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, because a lot of people, you know, on special occasions, it's always the special occasions where people skip church, right? It'll be Mother's Day, Father's Day, birthdays, anniversaries, you know, these special occasions where we may honor certain family members and we put God second. That should never be the case, right? We should never honor our father or mother more than the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, look what Jesus says in Matthew 10, 37. And it's funny, like, uh, you know, a lot of preachers always share these verses before special occasions to remind their church members, you know, that God should always come first, that you don't, you don't skip church in order to honor somebody that is less than the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 10, 37, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Of me. So you should always go to church on Sunday morning, even whether it's Father's Day or Mother's Day. You can always meet them for lunch afterwards, but you should set the example as a Christian to say, no, God is most important. I'm going to be in God's house on Sunday at church. I'm going to be with God's people, remembering, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, you know, ideally, you bring your parents to church, right? You bring your mother and father to church. And then, you know, you go and meet them afterwards for lunch or for dinner. And then, uh, you know, celebrate Mother's Day. But unfortunately, a lot of Christians skip church on these special occasions, and it ought not be the case. Now let's talk about the will of God for a woman. The first one I want to talk about when we looked at 1 Timothy 5 is a wife and a mother. A wife and a mother. You know, when I was growing up, I got saved when I was uh, 19, so 2005. And when I first started going to church, I was going to like a youth group in the church I was going to in Perth. And you know, in youth groups, uh, the, the topics that always you know, teenagers and young adults talk about, it's always, you know, BGR, what's BGR? Boy-girl relationships, that's a big one. The other one is university, your career. You know, and people are studying, you know, and they can't make it to youth group on Friday night because they've got to study and finish this assignment. You know, that's the sort of youth group life, you know, just the regular student life if you go, go through uni. But, uh, you know, every, every student just defaults going through uni, but, you know, really, people really should reconsider that these days, you know. 
I know I came out of uni with like a hex debt of like $25,000. I don't even use that, use that degree. So I think people really should think of uni as, as a training ground for their career and, and rather than just something they just fall into after high school. People waste a lot of money doing that. But anyways, you know, those are the sort of topics that people talk about. And I remember in youth group, and maybe, you know, you, you, if you grew up in a youth group, going to a youth group, you'd have the same experience where everyone's wondering, like, what is the will of God for my life? You know, you have young women in youth groups saying, like, you know, I want to know the will of God for my life. And, and really what they're talking about is, you know, which uni should they go to? What career should they take? All the things that God doesn't mention in the Bible. But you know, the thing about God's will is you don't have to wonder what God's will is often, more often than not. You know, because God has a word. He's got a Bible, right? He tells us what his will is. You know, so the, 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 the challenge in Christianity is not what to, to know what God's will is. He makes his will known to us because he has provided a Bible to us. The challenge is, will you do God's will once you learn what it is? You know, will you understand God's will? Yes, there are choices in life that we make, and that's generally as well what people tend to refer to when they say, like, what does God want me to do with my life? And sometimes that just is a choice that's up to you. You know, you may go ask God for direction in those things, but sometimes it's just your choice. You know, what job are you going to do? What, you know, it's like, it's like you don't get up in the morning and pray to God to say, God, what clothes do you want me to wear? You know, you make that choice, but God gives us principles. And it's the same when it comes to the will of God for a woman. I mean, there are some very clear statements in the Bible about, you know, what God wants for a woman. And, you know, the funny thing is, I don't remember, you know, when, it, when we always had these conversations about God's will for my life, God's will for a young woman, what does God want me to do? I don't remember one time in my youth group this verse ever coming up, you know. And I remember when I heard it preached on the first time, I was like, I can't believe this verse is in there. I don't know why women are still wondering what God wants, wants their primary goal to be. Um, but we see in 1 Timothy 5, but the younger widows refuse. For when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. Right, so these are widows that work for the church and the older ones that are over 60 that will no longer marry. And he's saying, hey, don't take in the ones that are under 60 because if they marry again, you know, they've kind of, you know, gone an, another way, right? And they're maybe not as committed to church as they should have been if they're being taken on as a worker in church. And with all they learn to be idle, because the younger ones will want to, may want to marry again. And with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house. So this is the problem with the younger ladies who aren't married, who don't have responsibilities to take care of children. Sometimes they get into trouble. Right, where they just go about being gossipers and tattlers and busybodies, the Bible talks about. Not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. I will, right? So what does that mean? This is what God wants. I will, therefore, that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. So there's a few things there. In verse 15, for some are already turned aside after Satan. Right? So this idea that if we get away from what God wants, there is a satanic agenda. You know, it's not that necessarily it's just like, when we talk about satanic, it's not like demon possession and all that sort of stuff. It's just a, it's a, it's an agenda that Satan has against God's will. Right? But then sometimes Christians willingly go that direction. They willingly want to get away from what God wants. And they don't realize that that's what Satan wants. Like, Satan doesn't want young women to marry. You know, they want them to fornicate and, you know, have a serious relationship. And then you've got the single moms and children out of wedlock and all the problems that come with, you know, abortion and all that sort of stuff. You know, that's, that's the one thing that all these pro-life organizations don't talk about, right? They're happy to talk about, you know, don't kill the child, adopt the child, you know, and maybe they even, now even um, choice for two with... Uh, uh, what's her name? Laura, Laura Klassen. I, kinda, I like that organization because she speaks out quite boldly against um, um, abortion. But she also speaks out against IVF. You know, that was like the one thing that all the pro-life organizations didn't want to touch because so many pro-lifers use IVF, right? IVF is when you stimulate, you know, the, the woman to, um, you know, produce more eggs than she should and then they fertilize all these eggs into a petri dish 
and because they're fertilized in a petri dish, a lot of them die, and all the ones that don't die, you know, they just in, you know, inject a bunch into the womb and hopefully some of them survive, uh, and the rest of them, they just keep on ice. You know, so this, uh, this, this, this completely inhumane process of creating babies is commercializing the birth industry. One organization, you know, Choice for Two, finally is speaking out against it. But, you know, but she is going that direction, it's good, because she's like, a, she seems like a Pentecostal Christian. But she's starting to speak against fornication, right? If you, if you want to stop the problem of abortions and unwanted children, then women need to stop sleeping with people. And that's, that's the root of the problem. Fornication is the root of the problem. So I want women to marry, right? Make a commitment to one person. Marry. Be in a marriage. Bear children. It's in that marriage. You know, you want to have children. God wants us to be fruitful and multiply. Guide the house. See, the primary responsibility of the woman is to take care of the home, take care of the children, raise and nurture children at home, while the primary responsibility of the husband is to go out and provide. Right? So sometimes people think, and I like to kind of like simplify things down because it, it just puts things in perspective where people think, oh, you know, women don't have all this opportunity and well, they have to just take care of the home. But then they're just seeing, you know, they're comparing all the different ways that men do the one objective, right, which is to make a living. That's, that's, the, that's the objective of a man, right, is to provide for his family, right? And he's providing for his wife so that the wife can be at home to raise the children. So the idea is raising the next generation. So they say, oh, men have all these options. Yeah, but the, all, the whole idea of the, all these options only exist because men make a living different ways, right? Like women obviously have different ways they can raise their children as well. So there's no, there's no limitation to how you raise your children. You have all different ways of how you can do it. And women get quite, quite creative in how they train and nurture and raise their children. So it's the same with men. They're just figuring out ways to provide. But the whole idea is women raise and nurture their children at home and men provide. But sometimes the world is trying to push women into the direction of the men where they want to go out and provide. Right? And you know, sometimes we glorify careers and we glorify achievements in this world too much more than raising children and we ought not to. And, and, and the, the, the vast majority of women that buy into the sat Satan's lie of not following you know, the will of God just end up doing mediocre jobs where they would probably be much more fulfilled if they just take care of their children at home. I mean, you know, they want to go out and be fulfilled and then they end up doing some dead-end admin job or some dead, you know, or, you know, they're doing the job of a mother. You know, they're being a nurse or they're being a childcare assistant or they're, they're taking care of children. You might as well just take care of your own children, right? And have your husband go out and earn a living. And then you can have more children, right? So... We don't want to buy into this, this lie, right? This lie from Satan. And sometimes Christians get this mentality as well, right? So it's not only in 1 Timothy 5. We see it in Titus 2 as well. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, right? So it's, it's not just the responsibility of the men, to set a good example for the next generation. It's the responsibility of women as well. See, the aged women have an expectation of how they are to behave and the sort of example they set. Right? Not false accusers. Right? Not just accusing people, oh, they, she said that, she meant this. You know, false, false accuser, accuser might be you know, when you assume somebody's intention. Oh, she did that, but she really meant this and she really meant that. You know, that's, that's being a false accuser, not given to much wine. Teachers of good things. Right? So you need to know things in order to teach good things. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet. What does that mean to be discreet? Discreet means you've got some discretion, right? You're not necessarily, you know, just out there. You know, some, some women are like very, very loud. You know, you notice when they enter the room, they want to get everyone's attention. Uh, that would be the opposite of discretion. Chase. Chase comes down to purity, right? Chastity. And I will extend that, I would extend that also to, in, to the way you look. 
You know, women should dress like they're chaste as well, right? And don't get caught up into, you know, just show, putting your body on social media and all that sort of thing in order to get the likes. You know, you want to be pure. You also want to look pure, right? And don't take special occasions like weddings and fancy dress parties in order to dress impure. You know, sometimes girls go, oh, I'm just going to a fancy dress party. Well, that doesn't, it's not an excuse for you to look impure, right? And for you to dress like somebody that is not chaste, not pure. Keepers at home, see? So there's that same, you know, primary responsibility, taking care of the home. Good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Do you see that? Do you see if we, if, if Christian women do not follow what God wants them to do. It's, it's detrimental, right? It's detrimental to the Word of God. And this is why it's so important. It's so important that we understand what God wants, that we strive for God wants, and we understand why God wants it this way. Now, one thing that I always find ironic about, you know, uh, you know God's will for a woman and on Mother's Day, and I say this all the time, is that on the one hand, the role of a mother is the most appreciated role. And on Mother's Day, this is what everyone says, you know, how hard it is to be a mother. You know, you got the memes where it's like, mom has to be like a chef, you know, a, a, a chauffeur, you know, she has to have like medical expertise, she's got to be like an educator. You know, there's all these different things that moms need to be in. It's such a hard role taking care of the children. And I agree, you know, I agree that being a mother is, is a lot tougher role than going out and working a job because dealing with adults is, is a lot easier than I think than dealing with children personally. Um, but maybe that's just a, a guy's point of view. Like maybe women you know, feel like they, they prefer you know um, being around children than being around adults and dealing with all that politics of the workplace. But on the other hand, even though it's such an appreciated role, on the other hand, when you tell somebody in the world, "Hey, well, I'm I'm a stay-at-home mom. I'm a housewife." The idea is, oh, you're just a housewife. You know, you're just a stay-at-home mom. You, you didn't amount to anything. You know, you didn't, didn't make anything of yourself. You just, like, you failed in life because you didn't, you know, go on and be, like, you know, start your own business and be a career woman, wear a suit and, and do all that. Which, you know, the world wants you doing the job of a man instead of that of a woman, right? And we saw below, before, that's like this satanic agenda. So this idea that God calls women to be keepers at home, this is not a lesser calling, right? This is the highest calling because our, our, one of our main roles in life is to raise godly children and this is how we do it because moms stay at home raising children and men go out to provide in order to provide for the home, right? So the call to serve the Lord is the highest calling. Philippians 3, brethren, I count on myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if and if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. So what I'm trying to encourage you just on this first point is be careful to not buy into this world's philosophy of just a housewife. Oh, you're just a mom. God's trying to put a dampener on you. There's nothing more valuable for a woman to do than to, to raise children, right? Children are very, very valuable. And, you know, it's, it's not even something everyone is able to do, right? But God wants everyone to be able to have children for those that are able to and it's a very very high calling it's an important thing so don't diminish it in your mind and buy into the world's philosophy all right number two the will of a will of god for a woman is to be a blessing it's to be a blessing you know i'll show you these verses and i, I know i talk about these a lot when i talk about women but we, i know we joke about them but the there's a very profound point that I'm trying to make with these verses, and I think the reason why they're in the Bible. Proverbs 21.9, It is better to dwell in, in a corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. <laughs> I always just find it funny. That it's better to, be, to live like in the corner of the attic, right, than to be in the house with a brawling, in a wide house. It's better, even if the house is so big, it's still better to be in the, the corner of the roof. 
Proverbs 21, 19, it is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and an angry woman. This is saying, and, I, and I'm sure, like, you know, it's like, I feel sorry for men that, that have wives like this. And, and, and they, this is why we laugh, because, you know, we probably know people like this, that they would rather just like, you know, get out of the place, leave, you know, rather than be with a contentious and an angry woman. But the, the, the important thing here is, that, and the point that I think, you know, is that we take away from these verses, it's that, you know, women can play a big part in the atmosphere of the home, in the atmosphere of a community, right? And when they are contentious, when they are angry, when they are, you know, violent, right? <laughs> Brawling, right? In a wide, wide house, they can destroy the environment that God has put them to there to, to, to make a loving and warm home, a loving and warm environment. Like, I think that's, that's what women do, right? Women bring... The, the love and the warmth to, to, to not just a home, but to a community. I mean, imagine, it's like, it's like that's why it's different when, you know, you're hanging out, it's just all guys, right? But then we have ladies there as well. It brings that warmth. It brings, it brings a different type of environment. You want to be a blessing to that environment. You know, that's why I, I do feel sorry for men that just marry girls for looks. You know, they ignore values. They ignore character. Because, you know, the looks fade very quickly. Unfortunately, a lot of young men make the wrong choices early on in life, right? They just marry someone. And, and you, know, you know how it is, and I, I talk to people about this all the time. I'm trying to discourage them from getting to, going too quick. I, I just had a few conversations just recently with a couple of young men. Um, one guy had uh, just recently broke up with his girlfriend, and another guy was thinking about marrying a girl, and he's only like 18 years old. And... And I was explaining to them, look, this is what happens, right, with young men. They get into a relationship, it's more physical than it should be, you know, it becomes intimate. And then what happens is you just get comfortable with that person, right? And it's hard to break the person's heart, break, break off, and find somebody that's actually compatible with you. So what happens? They just end up marrying the person that was just convenient for them to marry because they've just been together for a long time. And they've probably fornicated, they've probably done all sorts of things together. Right? But they never actually figured out whether they were philosophically in line. And then they get married. And that's when all the problems start. And they realize, oh, I didn't know you believed this. I didn't know you expected that. You know, I didn't know that's what we expected about true us. I didn't know that's what you didn't want to do. I didn't know that that's what you've got to stop me from doing. And then, you know, I'm not even that old. I mean, I'm 35 years old. Already I know friends that got married and they're already divorced. You know, because that that beauty, you know, it fades extremely quickly if you marry this sort of woman, right? Contentious and angry woman, brawling woman. So we don't, we don't want to, you don't want to be that sort of mom. You don't want to be that sort of lady, you know? God's will for you is to be somebody that is, is, is a blessing when, you, when you're in that, that environment. And we look at Proverbs 31, she openeth her mouth with wisdom and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also. See, sometimes children love the mom. Does your husband love the wife? Right? Does he like being around? See, the Proverbs 31 woman creates an environment where children and the husband want to be around her. And he praiseth her. You know, I, want to, I would want Christian women to think, hey, I want to be the sort of mom, the sort of wife, the sort of sister, the sort of daughter that when people are talking about me behind my back, you know, people are talking to me with their colleagues and stuff, they don't describe me as the old ball and chain, you know? Right? You don't want to be described, oh, as the old ball and chain, oh, you know, it's like sometimes you're sitting with a bunch of guys and the wife calls and they're like, oh, should I take this, you know? Is that the sort of wife you want to be? Is that the sort of mom you want to be? No, right? You want to be so sort of when the, the wife calls, it's like, oh man, it must be something important. It must be something more, you know, he, he appreciates you. But, and I understand there are two, two sides of that coin. But what can you control as the lady? We're talking about the ladies today. Is you want to try and be a blessing so you don't create that sort of environment. You know, the mother has the power to set the atmosphere of the home. You know, that's why we joke about the saying, happy wife, happy life. So it comes down to, you know, how you talk, behave, 
how you go about your work in the home. It will affect the home environment for your husband and children. You know, does your husband need some questions? Does your husband look forward to coming home? How will your children remember their upbringing? I know that's something that my wife tells me all the time, reflects on it. You know, she's had a, she's had a rough day at home. It's been a bit hard on the kids. She's feeling guilty at night, you know, saying, oh, you know, I don't want my kids growing up remembering that mom was just like, oh, pulling out her hair and just yelling at them all the time, you know? So these are the things that we have to be reminded of. I mean, we all do it, right? We've all had those bad days, you know, they, the children bring the best out of you, they bring the worst out of you. But it's good to be reminded that God wants you to be a blessing to your family. And then the way we go about raising our family and having relationships with other people, our, our spouse and others, you know, what... What are they going to remember when they grow up? And I think it's important because the sort of relationship you build with your children as a mother is, will they desire to return home when they're older? You know, maybe some of you, you know, be like, oh, you know, I've got to go see my mom. You know, I've got to go back to my mom's house, you know, for Mother's Day. You know, is that the sort of mother you want to be? Or do you want to be the sort of mother where they look forward to come to see you, look forward to come to talk to you? Sometimes mothers are their, are their own detriment to their own children's relationship because they burn the relationships with their children. But you will, you know, you're going to reap what you sow. So you want to be a blessing. Number three, God's will for a woman is he wants women to value children, to value children. And this is a hard thing to do. This is something that requires faith, right? Because raising children is not an easy task. Right? But we need to value children and realize that one of our most important work as parents is bringing children into this world and raising them to love and serve God. Psalm 127.1, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Right? Do we see children as a reward or do we see them as a burden? Do we see children as just something like on the bucket list? You know, yeah, I had a kid, done that. Now move on to something else. Right? As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Is that how you see your kids? You see your kids as somebody you can send out into the world and be an example? Well, you've got to spend time raising them. Right? Spend time influencing them. So there's some, they're going to be extra salt and light that we inject into the world. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, for they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. You know, that, that phrase there, I mean, that kind of reminds me. I don't know, like, I don't know, I don't know if that's how it should be taken, but I just had the thought just then when I read it is, you know, like people don't, people don't regret having too many children, right? Like I think people regret not having any children, not having any more children. Yeah, but nobody ever regrets having too many children. They shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Psalm 120, 128, 1. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Thy children like olive plants round about thy table. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. So you see how we need to see children as a blessing. You know, children are not a burden. Children are not something that we should be avoiding. You know, if children are a blessing, don't you want more blessings? Right? So we need to see children the way God sees children. And God wants women to see children that way too. And not value a career. You know, not value man's role in society more than children. The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion, and thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. Yea, thou shalt see thy children's children in peace upon Israel. Matthew 16, 26. For what shall a prophet, what shall what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? But what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So a soul of somebody is worth more than all the world. So if you are responsible for a few souls. I mean, how much do you have in your care? People will boast about how much assets they have, how much assets maybe they manage at work, the size of their portfolio. Well, 
if somebody has a portfolio of five, ten houses, you know, they manage, maybe they own property. Somebody has five to ten children. Let me ask you, who's richer? So you might say, oh, the person that forgave, gave up all those riches to raise children, they're not as rich. I don't see it that way. I see it if I have more children than that person, I'm richer than them. Right? Because what, what good is a house going to do in terms of the kingdom of God? Right? What, what good are the, now, I'm not saying it's necessarily wrong to have these things. I'm saying in comparison, who is better? Which one was worth the trade-off? You know, so I'm not saying it's wrong to have property. I'm not saying it's wrong to be successful. But my point is, if you did it, you know, the opportunity cost, you know, if you gave up having children in order to pursue that, I just don't think that was worth it. You know, I think you try and have as many children as you can and try and be as successful as you can. But you have your priorities right. Right? So children are the most valuable possession you have. Don't get sucked into valuing money over souls. You know, and, and one way I like to think about it is, you know, sometimes people, you know, now here's, how, here's how I put it, right? How we value children. You know, sometimes people don't want to have any more children, right? And I just think it's, that's not a wise thing to do. I think we should have as many children as we can. Um, you know, obviously spacing them out, maybe for health reasons and whatnot. And everybody has different ability. I'm not saying that uh, everyone has the same ability or same situation. But if you think about it, if you have a child <clears throat> and for whatever reason that child is sick or that child may lose its life, I mean, most people would think, well, we do whatever we can to save that life. You know, once somebody, once somebody loses their health and their life is at risk, that's when people start to realize how valuable life is. Uh, they do whatever they can to, to, to save that person or to bring them back to health and to give them back some sort of quality of life. But my question to people is, why don't we value children the same when we think about bringing a child into the world? Why, why will we do whatever it takes to save a life? But we don't value life the same way when we can gain a life. And that just goes back to that perspective of what, what do we value more? You know, do we value career, our own aspirations, you know, especially for a lady, more than what God wants? Right? Now, one thing I want to mention on this point is and, and um, you see this a lot in the pro-life movement, right? Because they're trying to make the point that, you know, you can, you can because women are, like, getting abortions. Like, the, 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 I don't know who the lady was that, like, thanked you. She got this Grammy Award because she had all these abortions. So one of the slogans of the pro-life movement that I'm starting to see is they say, uh, oh, you can be a successful woman and have a career and have all these things and still be a mother, Right? And, and, they're, and they're right, right, in the sense that, you know, can you be a mother and have a successful career and have to chase all the things that the world wants you to chase and still be a mother? Well, that's true. But the question is, what sort of mother are you going to be? You know what I think it's not, that, that is not possible, is you can't be a mother of many children and do that. Now you, tell, you show me a woman that's, that's climbed up, you know, started their own business, is a great entrepreneur, maybe she's on Shark Tank, you know, Maybe she's even like, you know, some, some politician, right? All the ladies, they say they're a mom, they're a politician. You've got to ask, like, what's, what sort of mom are they? How many children do they have? Right? Yeah, because maybe you have one or two children and you stop there and then you end up chasing your career. I just think that's kind of unfortunate that you could have had more children, but you decided to have a career over children. Right? Because that's the truth of it, people. The truth of it is you may be able to be a mother and be a successful career woman, but you won't have many children <laughs> and be a successful career woman. And when, you, and when you speak, you know, the sad thing is when you speak to a lot of these career women and you ask them how they raise their children, usually it's they're in daycare, put them in school, grandma and, you know, grandma and grandpa have to raise the kids. Why? Because she has to go to meetings and everything like that. I remember talking, I'm sure I, I tell you, I probably, you guys who have been in church for a while are probably repeating all these stories all the time, but they're good examples and they stick with me. And I, I spoke with this one lady at work once, and she was like the head of one of the departments, very ambitious, moving up, in the, and, and she had kids. And I, I remember talking to her, and I just said, like, how do you do it? Like, how, how do you, you, you know, you just gave birth to another kid. You're back at work a few months later. I'm like saying, how do you do it? It's still like, 
have all the responsibilities of somebody that's like a head of a department in a large organization. And she said, yeah, well, she's, you know, childcare and her, and her parents take care of the kids. And I just think, it's, it's not me, it's not being a mom, you know, you're, like, you're having somebody else be the mom, right? So even though they say like, you know, you can be a successful career woman, you can be a mom at the same time, just think, well, what sort of mom are you? You know, and are you the sort, especially for Christians, are you the sort of mom that God wants you to be? Where, and it goes on to my next point, this is the last point I'm going to finish on, is number four, is God wants you, the will of God for a woman, to be a teacher, to be a teacher. Let's look at a few verses first. Deuteronomy 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. So I say, you know, if you want to be a teacher to your children, you've got to know stuff first. You're going to be teachers of good things. You've got to know what's good first to teach good things, like it says in Titus. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently. You see, diligently? Diligently means you take responsibility to make sure your children know and understand the values that you have, right? You don't just stick them in daycare and just say, oh, this daycare is good. Hopefully they'll take care of that for me. Stick them in a Sunday school in some church and hopefully that'll, that'll rub off on them. You know, hey, these things are supplementary, right? But you, thou shalt teach them. See, thou shalt teach them diligently. What does it mean to be It means you're thorough. It means you make sure of it. Unto thy children shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up. You can see why they use this verse for homeschooling, right? Because the idea is that your children are always with you, right? So the idea here is how can you teach them diligently when you sit in your house, when you're out walking, when you're lying down, when you rise us up. It gives this idea that your children are with you and you teach them, right? Now, I'm not saying that this is saying that you must homeschool. I'm just saying you can see why, it's, why homeschool is used, why this verse is used to promote homeschool. Because right? the idea is that you're more involved in your children's lives and education. Right? And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. Deuteronomy 4, verse 7. For what nation is there so great, which who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, unless they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. You know, and, and when I read this verse, you know, I talk about normally trying to influence not just the next generation, but the generation after that. But it brings me back to my other point of being a blessing to your family and being a blessing in the environment so you're wanted around because you know what? You're not going to be able to teach your grandchildren if your children don't even want you around. You see what I mean? So if you want to, if you want to influence the lives of your grandchildren, then try and be a blessing to your children. Make sure you raise your children to understand why you did it the way you did so they don't go off and, you know, use different methods or different values than you have, and then you, you will want, they will want you around, right? Because you taught your children well, you guys see Ida, you're a blessing, and then you will able, you'll be able to teach not just your sons, your children, but your children's children, right? So we want to have influence over more than one generation. So you see, a mother teaches, teaches her children. Sometimes the, the mother is often the first one to teach children on a topic, right? If you are at home. And this is why, you know, people ask me all the time, you know, like, Victor, you know, why do you guys homeschool? You know, when I'm out and about, you know, because I, you know, you, you talk to parents, you know, I'm tell, telling you guys about, you know, being more friendly when you go to, like, community things and stuff like that. So, you know, you talk to the parents, and then they ask you, oh, it's cool, do your kids go, oh, they homeschool? Oh, they always ask, well, why do you homeschool? And uh, one of the reasons I tell them is just about time spent with children. I know teachers, um, and they often tell me that you know, they are often seen more as the parent than the children's parent themselves, because they spend more time with them. You know, they're the ones teaching them how to read and write. They're the ones teaching them values. They're the ones that are with them when they experience things. And I explain to people, look, I, 
I, we didn't want to give that experience to somebody else. You know, we brought the children into the world. We wanted that blessing. We, we wanted to be able to experience that. Yeah, it's not as easy as putting them in school. But, you know, we didn't want to give that blessing to somebody else. And, and often people will understand that. They'll understand that, that sort of reasoning. That, that's, a, that's a big draw for why you want to spend more time with your children. Now, I won't read all of Proverbs 31, but I'll just skip through it and we'll just... But Proverbs 31, we know, is the Proverbs of a virtuous woman. But why is this important in regards to being a teacher and God's will for a woman? Is that Proverbs 31, you see how it starts? The words of King Lemuel, and this is believed to be King Solomon. The prophecy, look at this, that his mother taught him. So Proverbs 31 was a proverb not from Solomon, it was from Solomon's mother, right? But then it became part of God's word. And I think this is why Proverbs 31 is just such a great proverb for women, because it not only teaches about what a virtuous woman is, but it's even a proverb that was taught to somebody by a woman, right? The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. Now, what we get from Proverbs 31, because it goes on, the first part of the chapter is teaching how to be a good king, the dangers of women, the dangers of alcohol, right? Um, things like this, being, being, being a, a voice for the voiceless, open thy mouth for the dumb in the cause of all, such as are appointed. And then it goes on saying, well, who can find a virtuous woman? And then she goes on to explain, hey, this is the sort of woman a virtuous woman is. So what's important from here is, you know, like mothers can teach on topics even though it may not even apply to her. Right? This is why it's so important that people, you know, you, you say, well, I'm not a mother, you know, I'm a young guy, I'm a dad, I just switch off on a sermon like this. Well, this is, a good, this is a good example where you ought not switch off on sermons like this because even as men, you need to understand what a virtuous woman is. I mean, the mother of King Lemuel thought that it was valuable for King Lemuel to know what a good mother was and what a virtuous woman was, Right? But the same token, look, this mother knew what it meant to be a righteous king. She was never going to be a king. But you see what she knew, what it meant to be a righteous king. So she could teach her son what it meant to be a righteous king. You see, so this is why it's important that all Christians know the Bible and you know different aspects of life because you can impact more people. Like if you only know things like in a self-centered way or things that apply to me, I mean, how are you ever going to give a girl counsel? How are you ever going to give a daughter counsel? How are you ever going to give, you know, another Christian who doesn't have Christians around them counsel about these things? Well, you need to know these things. And this is one of God's will for a woman that you know these things. And this is why Proverbs 31 is here. That the, the mother of King Lemuel knew things that didn't directly apply to her. And because, you know, you're often going to be the first one to teach your children on topic. Right? So you're going to you're going to have to have good advice about, you know, you know, how to speak, relationships, you know, teach your young boys how to be men. You know, it's not just the responsibility of the father. You know, just like it's not only the responsibility of the mother to teach the daughters how to be ladies. You know, and this is why we understand, you know, with all transgender arguments and all that sort of stuff, having a mother and father is important. They bring two sides of the coin to bring balance to the child. So, you will set the standard of morality and example. You must know things in order to teach them. You know, just remember your example, what example you set for your children. Um, you know, so I was talking to a mate recently at Jiu Jitsu, and we were talking about, you know, being a good example for our children. Uh, we were just talking as we were, we were watching, and he was saying he was, he was parked behind a... Uh, um, uh, a car and you know we're talking about how much we hate like just rubbish because sometimes I, I, I hate people like just throwing and don't you guys do it as well like if you see our cups and stuff around here pick them up please don't just leave your cups and your plates out and around don't just throw your cigarette butts into the garden you know put them in the bin and you say people say oh Victor you you care about the planet so much I don't, it's not because I care about the planet it's because I just think Christians should be clean you know, I think, I think we should be respectful of other people that have to share this world with us. And I just hate the fact, you know, I hate when I have to go to the beach and there's like plastic bags in the beach because some, you know, disrespectful person just throwing their rubbish around. You know, you go to the car park and people eat 
you know, their McDonald's or whatever. And they just drive away and just leave all their rubbish in the car park. Don't you guys be like that. Don't you dare be like that. All right? I hate that. <laughs> so we want to be a good example. Oh, a story about my mate. Did you see? So, so he was sitting behind the car, and then mother was just throwing rubbish out the window. Right? And then he, got, he saw on the other side, the daughter also throwing rubbish out the window. And he's just saying, like, look, you know, like the parents are, so are the children. I said, what sort of example are you? You know, you want your children to be the Christian you are? I want my children to be the Christian I am, you know? That's why I'm trying to be a good Christian, because I want them to be good Christians, right? So you need to think about that as well in your uh, life, right? All right, let's just finish on this last point. So we talked about, you know, will of God for a woman, my wife and a mum. That's what God wants first and foremost. You want to be a blessing, value children, be a teacher. The last verse I want to go to is just to remind us that life is so short. James 4.13. Go to now ye that say, today or tomorrow, you'll go into such a city, continue there year, and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye not, know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. You know, life is short. Even shorter is the time you have with your children. All right, so a reminder today for mothers is you know, remember to enjoy the journey. Remember to enjoy the journey. You know, it's, it's a short time you have with your children. I know sometimes it feels very long. And, you know, with parents, sometimes you're just so, you're just so uh, eager to get to the next step. Oh, I just hope, oh, I can't wait till they can walk, uh, crawl. I can't wait till they can walk. I can't wait till they can take care of themselves. And before you know it, they're, they're out of the house. It reminds me of that movie. Um, I never watched it, but I remember the concept was, you know, was it Switch? Where the guy, like, uh, I can't remember what the the actor's name was, yeah, yeah, and it's like, you know, he wanted, to, he wanted to keep, like, clicking over the boring parts of his life, and then the whole moral of that movie was, you know, that's what life is. Life is a series of these challenges, and if you just skip through them, you're not enjoying them as you go along, you just skip through all of life, and life is over, right? So it's the same with kids, you know? When you go through parenting, you're always looking forward to the day that it's over, but my encouragement to you is, you know, enjoy it while it lasts, because it'll be over sooner than you realise. And then life is short, enjoy the moments, uh, one day you'll realize how quickly it all went by. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Um, Lord, thank you for the, the mums in our church. And I pray, Lord, for those that seek to be mums as well. I pray that you bless them with many children. Uh, help us not to uh, value the things of the world more than our children. Help us to be a good example. Help us to teach them diligently. Uh, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.